Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. This video is going to look at the ways in which Parliament interacts with the executive. So essentially what we're really looking at here is, is the idea of scrutiny and, and how Parliament looks at what government does and tries to hold them to account and checks up on the departments and the, the role of ministers and the policies and whether those policies have been carried out properly. So it's a really important part of what Parliament does, uh, and it's an important stage in, in what we're looking at in uh, UK politics. So this again, this is part of component two. So uh, for Edexcel A-level politics, uh, component two, this is uh, section 2.4, uh, the ways in which Parliament interacts with the executive. And so the spec tells us we need to look at the role and significant backbenches in both houses, including uh, the importance of parliamentary privilege, uh, the work of select committees, uh, the role and significance of the opposition, uh, the purpose and, and nature of ministerial question time, including prime minister's question time. So I'm going to try and look at all of that. The role and significance of backbenches in both houses, including the importance of parliamentary privilege. Well, Parliamentary privilege is, is quite a mind-blowing, quite a, a, a kind of a crazy thing, really. So within Parliament, MPs have complete freedom of speech. Uh, they are protected from libel laws. Uh, so, for example, um, if, if back in uh, 2011, uh, a Lib Dem MP actually named Ryan Giggs as having uh, the person who had uh, issued a, a gagging order on the press. Now. If a member of the press had, had raised it, then they would have um, they would have been breached the gagging order, and they could have been charged. If any, essentially any member of the public had done it, they would have been uh, potentially um, uh, uh, potentially facing libel charges. But an MP saying it in the House is completely uh, above those. And again, it created a debate at the time about uh, whether that was right and proper. Now, backbenchers uh, are. <sighs> are sometimes really really important and, and sometimes they are, are are just what we call lobby fodder in, in essence backbenchers are those um mps who are not on the front bench of the government so they, they they're not they don't hold hold some kind of cabinet position uh at, or and they're not in the opposition and, and have kind of some kind of leadership role or hold, hold a shadow cabinet position so and they just are backbenchers because they physically sit behind the front benches who are the, who are uh, the people in charge of the two two major parties. Now, backbenchers, particularly are, are, of the government, are often considered essentially to be lobby fodder, as I said, which is, essentially means is their job is just to turn up and walk through the right the yes lobby uh, when the government's passing a bill, and the no lobby when the opposition's proposing amendments and stuff like that, and and, and vice versa for the the backbenchers of the, of the opposition parties. They, so they are there essentially to support party leadership. Now, there are a variety of things that might keep them in line, such as uh, the promise of, of future office. So, yes, the prime minister has been, has been watching you, is impressed and may consider you for a cabinet position in the future. How do you fancy being junior minister for? Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, the backbenchers in, in the House of Lords are often uh, retired uh, retired politicians are, they're, and, and are therefore more likely to actually be experts in a particular field. Uh, they are therefore more likely to be independent. There, there is whip, there, there are whips for the, the backbenchers in the in the Lords, but it's not as effective. And, and actually what you've got is you've got lots and lots of crossbench independent uh, Lords. Um, also, because of the stages that they tend to be at in terms of their lives and their careers, I mean, they're, they're not. There's very few of them who are looking for uh, promises of uh, of office and position uh, than there would be in the House of Commons. Normally, it's being a politician isn't their primary job. Um, so they, they they've been doing something else, and that's why they've got a position in the House of Lords. Uh, the exception to that is, is retired politicians, but they they often. Uh, just want to speak their minds rather than uh, being constrained by party as they probably have been uh, for the rest of their career. Now, the significance of, of backbenchers essentially, I mean, it, uh, for me, all of this really comes down to parliamentary arithmetic. Um, now, if a government has a huge majority, or even just a big, significant, big, decent majority, then backbenchers become less important because even without a, a minor rebellion, 
then the government can get done what it wants to get done. And and so, for example, uh, as I'm making the, the, this video in March 21, we, we, we've got a government with a majority of 80. So there will be minor rebellions on a variety of stuff. Um, back, the, some conservative backbenchers will be annoyed about some things, but they can't they can't unless there is a rather large unified group they can't do anything to stop government action now if the opposite is true if the government is a minority government or has a tiny majority then backbenchers suddenly are hugely important because they can swing what the government does and they can pressure the government into going into particular in particular di directions um it, we saw this in the conservative party with the erm that became increasingly powerful as the uh, in being able to block government bills when we, we had coalition government when we had and then particularly when we had uh, May with a small with small majority in it and then with uh, as a minority administration. So backbench rebellions, um, 30, there was rebellions on 35% of divisions uh, for the 2010-2015 parliament, uh, which was up for 20, from 28% of 2005-2007. Well, not, not really a surprise because um, you're moving from a majority government to uh, a coalition. Um, now, after 2015, however, stuff w w has been quite remarkable. Um, again, maybe not maybe not surprising given the arithmetic in Parliament, but the number of votes that were lost, for example, of the May and Johnson administrations between 2017 and 2019, it, it w was just completely unprecedented. Um, I mean, uh, Boris Johnson lost 100% of his early votes as Prime Minister uh, and actually ended up suspending 21 conservative MPs from having the whip, kind of like the strongest action that a, a the party leader and whip and, and whip office can take against people, and that that included people like Kenneth Clark and Nicholas Soames, so people who aren't you wouldn't naturally see as huge rebels, but there we you, there and again this is one of the important things in politics is it is often when people get caught up in the events of a particular moment in time you're really excited about it, kind of cataclysmically changing. Um, the way that things work in that moment of time backbenchers were enormously significant and and and, and really could kind of give the government a black eye and, and 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 put it in a terrible position you just roll forward a couple of years and and they just can't again so it, it, that arithmetic the arithmetic bit is i i i would always argue and in, in any essay any writing on this it, it is the really big thing when you're looking at the power of the backbenchers Urgent questions, which is, is, is something that the uh, backbenchers can can uh, push forward when there, there are things that they're unhappy about, things that are going on, things that they want more information on. Uh, they have become more frequent, particularly over the issue of Brexit. Uh, but on average, they were increasing before this. I mean, we, we can see a trend. So that it was uh, 0.2 per sitting day 2013 14. Just under 0.5 per sitting day, 15, 16. Just under 0 .9, just under 0.9, 17 to 19. So we can see that, and that would suggest actually that the role of backbenchers is is increasing. Um, what will be interesting will be as we get more data going forward to see what happens in 2021, 21, 22, 23, 24, and that and on, on as we go on from that, was this just because of the circumstances of the time. So moving into coalition government, then into uh, minority government with, with the uh, the whole thing with the Brexit, with Brexit, did that just give us special circumstances? Or is this genuinely a case that the backbenchers are becoming uh, more powerful? Um, backbenchers raising, raising an issue, however, is, is not really the same as it bringing about change. So backbenchers have the power to, for example, um, through the 10 minute rule of, of making statements about stuff, about talking about policy direction and things like that, or raising what they think is something that should be made law. Now, very few of them actually should lead to a law change. Now, they, they get publicity, they, they might get a bit of press for it. Um, they might then get and sit down with a with a senior member of the uh, the party and, and go well actually tell us a bit more about it we're quite interested in this but it, it actually then transferring into actual law it, it, it is far less likely 
the committees that the backbenchers um, sit on, and we'll look at those in a bit more detail later on, that they, they are created proportional to the distribution of seats. So, yes, committees are going to play an important role, and that's where the backbenchers can, can, can really get into their teeth into kind of the minutiae of what a department's doing, things like that. But the government controls the committee controls the committee so again if the government has a large majority then the committee is going to have a large government majority on it so therefore really actually it, how much is it going to do to damage the government so the power patronage uh, party loyalty and the whips keep, keep most backbenchers in line most of the time um and, and as i've said since 2019 the big conservative majority has weakened the position of any potential backbench rebels that that has been backbench opposition to some government covid measures so particularly there there, there is a, at, at the moment there's some backbench disquiet about the slowness of the the removal of of, of the uh, the various restrictions and there have been complaints about that and other issues by the conservative backbenchers before that but given the, the arithmetic, it's very hard for them to, to necessarily have as big an impact as, as as groups of the same size would have done a matter of a a, a matter of months earlier. When when if you go back to the uh, the pre the 2019 election, then if you have a, a, any kind of backbench opposition within the Conservative Party, it really would have been a, a, a huge issue that could have changed things quite significantly. Now, there's been a, 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 some big changes in, in the significant backbenches going going back um, to 2010. Um, so it, it, this kind of goes back to the, um, the, the the coalition government, and this is a lot of the stuff that, that the kind of Lib Dems were really keen to, to push through. Uh, I mean, they get, again, there were, there's the stuff of the coalition government that was grabbed huge headlines, stuff like um, tuition fees and stuff like that. But there were there was actually some stuff that the Liberal Democrats were pushing in the background that started to to change. Uh, some of the stuff in Parliament. Um, so we start we've got the Backbench Business Committee set up in 2010. And the idea of this was to, to give backbenchers more of a say in the agenda in Parliament. Um, so members are, are, are elected by their party. Um, now this does mean that rebellious MPs are less likely to be selected. So for example, if the if the election was done as it originally intended with, with it being selected by the House as a whole, then you might get those who are, are likely to, to kind of side with the opposition at times who, who would get on it. Um, so the, the Backbench Business Committee um, chooses topic for debate on 35 days in each parliamentary session. Um, some of those are chosen from e-petitions. So this is something you might have, have seen or got involved in where you've got these uh, online petitions. And if they get more than 100,000 signatures, then then the committee might can then push that forward and, and say, right, we really need to discuss this in Parliament. Uh, the committee also tends to to promote proposal, proposals with cross-party support for debate. So something that the government might not write, raise, but that there are there are support not only on the government benches but on the opposition benches, and and, and something that therefore might get done. Um, now the impact of the the uh, the backbench business committee, its impact is it, it's debated. So on the positive side, it, it has enabled debates that government would have otherwise have avoided. Uh, particularly with the e-petitions, uh, it, it has led to some changes, for example, uh, reducing a fuel duty. Um, the e-petitions, again, encourages engagement with the public, which has got to be a positive for Parliament. H however, the, the government doesn't need to accept any of these motions. Uh, even if they're voted for, the government can still kind of go, no, we don't want to do that. Um, it, the change in membership, so as I said, initially uh, it was... Um, it was voted on, the membership was voted on by the whole house, but the fact that it's voted within party groups means again, essentially the whips and stuff get involved and, and you're, you're less likely to, to, to see a, um, a hugely rebellious uh, backbench business committee. Um, the other bit is, is that the small parties again are underrepresented because again, when you're breaking a large number down into smaller numbers, then the, the small parties just get kind of, they, they tend to get missed out a bit. So there are problems, there are, there are positives on it, and it is something that has changed in, in the in fairly recent Parliament. Probably the biggest area where we see this interaction between uh, Parliament uh, and the Executive is through the Select Committees, uh, and these play a really important role. So in, in the... Um, in in the Commons, then the, we have the select committees. Select communities are, are responsible for scrutinising of government departments. For example, you have things like the Health Select Committee, uh, the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee. Each 
each committee has a number of members. It is normally uh, 11. There was one on, on Brexit, which was much bigger, but they're, they're, they're normally of 11. And then there will be smaller subcommittees which might look at particular individual bits. Um, so you might have a, 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 a in the uh, culture, media and sports like committee, you might have a, sub, a subcommittee that looks at football or something like that. Uh, members are selected by secret uh, secret ballot within the parliamentary groups. Um, you know, it was by whips. Again, this is another change that came in from 2010. So before 2010, it was done. Uh, the whips decided who was on what committees again, showing the power the, the whips had. And so that, that power of the whips over backbenchers has been reduced because it, you're actually voted for by your colleagues to get see whether you get on to these different select committees. Um, and that's given the site committees a bit more profile and a, a bit more and, and again seemingly a bit more in terms of um, uh, scrutiny and, and, and holding government to account uh, members are then often chosen because they have uh, expertise so um, uh, Sarah Wilson uh, was who was uh, before becoming MP was it was a GP was, was selected to go on the health select committee and you so you get a number of things like that now, in an ideal world, what happens is that members spend a, a long time on a committee and, and therefore they become more and more expert at it. It's not always the case, but that, that kind of is the ideal. So select committees examine uh, the departments. Um, they they uh, look at the department's key objectives. They look at its priorities, look at its policies, look at its expenditure. Uh, they look at its performance. Um, they look at any primary or secondary legislation proposals that it's involved in. They, it looks at how policy, how well policy has been implemented. It looks at, uh, at, at uh, key appointments that are being made within it, uh, and again can hold pre-appointment hearings and things like that. So again, the, the, the select committee can really go into every kind of last little bit of detail on the department. Uh, and the House of Lords is different. Whether they they have committees, but they aren't they aren't aligned with departments. So they they might look at issues. In the laws, but they don't. They don't look at departments in the details that they do in the Commons. So the, the select committees themselves decide what they're going to look at. Uh, they have the parents to summon witnesses, um, and and it's some of these uh, select committees uh, inquiries that they've held have had fairly major impacts. So culture, media, and sports select committee uh, on press standards 0910 and on phone hacking 1112 held a number of really high profile interviews. It, its discovery led on to the Leveson inquiry uh, and some police investigations. Um, the Business Energy and uh, Energy Industrial Strategy Committee 2016 was highly critical of Officer Philip Green uh, and said, essentially said that he had to solve out uh, solve the problems of the, the BHS uh, pension scheme. So we, we have seen stuff where where actually the select committees have got gone in and they they've actually made a, a difference and 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 again they 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 can be. Um, quite wide ranging uh, so some of these are, are looking out and and kind of looking at what's going on and some of it, is, it can be looking inward and can be can, kind of really uh, picking holes in what a department is doing so do they do a good job well the, the, there are some arguments that that says yes they, they give detailed examination of government policies and actions and uh, with the ability to question ministers civil servants uh, in, including pre-appointment hearings for figures such as the, the governor of the Bank of England, which obviously is a massively important job, as well as others, uh, as, as well as the ability to request uh, government documents. Um, we do occasionally see uh, issues with this when they, they, the documents come out massively redacted or, or don't come out at all. Um, they they can have a massive impact because the recommendations uh, are, are quite frequently, about 40% of the time, according to a study in 2011, uh, accepted by the government. And therefore, they are directly impacting on, on what departments uh, do. Uh, and yes, you can argue that they're, they're doing a good job because the chairs and the members of the, the, these um, select committees are elected and, and are, have, have shown since 2010 in particular enhanced independence. On the other hand, there's the argument that says, well, no, they, they, they aren't doing a great job. So the government has a majority on all the committees. So that would again immediately start to suggest that the government is not necessarily going to get the hardest ride from its own MPs because of the, there's such a big emph uh, emphasis in UK politics on uh, party unity. Uh, attendance uh, on select committees is not compulsory for its members. Um, I said earlier that it, 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 it kind of real expertise comes with experience on, on a select committee. So often we, we're seeing a really high turnover in membership and therefore you aren't building that level of expertise. 
again, you can argue no, because they, they, they can't propose policy uh, and can, can, government can often uh, ignore their recommendations. Um, and so it's very unusual for them to bring about major changes in, in policy. Now, again, the flip side of the yes that we looked at a minute ago that said that 40% of what they recommend is taken on, which automatically means that 60% of it isn't, which would fit in that no bit. And again, those will counter each other uh, quite nicely if you were looking at it in an essay. Another reason to argue they're not doing a great job is that the ministers or civil servants may not answer all the questions provided, or they might not, they might not provide all the documents requested. Um, they, they might be blocked from talking to some people at all. So, for example, 2013 may blocked a, an interview with the then head of the MI5. Um, and one of the other criticisms that, that feeds into this in terms of the way it's carried out that with ministers and civil servants not answering questions and not providing documents is that, that actually the inquiries can be overly confrontational. Uh, and and that then means can lead to them being uh, not very effective uh, as they, the, the, the witnesses are barraged by members of the select committee. And again, it starts to look like um, a political point scoring rather than, than, than detailed uh, and effective scrutiny. Now, another key area in Parliament and, and somewhere else that should hold the government to account is the opposition. And I've talked earlier about um, about parliamentary arithmetic. Now, really, the job of the opposition is to criticise whatever the government does. Really, um, it, it, the the difficulty they have is, is is they can just get outvoted all the time. So the government, if it has a majority, like our government, uh, go, uh, our current government does, then the opposition can can shout and scream and make a noise and point out what the government is doing has got flaws in it, but they can't actually stop any of it. Uh, because the government has got the power just to push stuff through Parliament. Um, uh, opposition leaders and shadow cabinet members often attack the government both inside and outside Parliament. I mean, outside, normally kind of they'll, they'll go on Andrew Marr or, or Newsnight or interviewed on the news or whatever it is or by, the, by a newspaper and in it they'll, they'll talk about how the government's doing things terribly wrong. Um, they, they can do that inside Parliament as well. There are big set piece events where, where, where the opposition plays a really important role. So responding to the Queen's speech, um, responding to the government's budget, uh, and we'll see other things like question time and things like that uh, a bit later on in the video. Um, 20 days are, are given over to opposition parties to set the subject for debate. Um, 17 of those are decided by the leader of the main opposition party, so that would be Keir Starmer at the moment. Um, all normally face government amendments and uh, and and the motions are cancelled out or not carried. So, yeah, I mean, and, and 20 days is is not a, a, not a huge amount. So remember, we talked about the the backbench committee, uh, the backbench business committee getting 35. So, uh, opposition here, it, it it's hard to make a case. I think sometimes that the opposition has a massively important role in Parliament. Uh, it, it 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 can raise objections, it can point things out. Now really the the arena it's playing to is the arena of public of public opinion. So it can it, it, it by showing the flaws in the government it become it can become increasingly popular, the government can become increasingly unpopular and that can have a big impact going into the, the, the election afterwards. But actually just stopping government business in its tracks going through is quite hard. Uh, the opposition received something called short money, uh, and that this is funding to provide them with the necessary uh, support to, to for for their for the opposition officers, so they can hold the government to account. Um, this was reduced by controversy by the government in 2015 as part of austerity. Now the, the whole idea behind this is that, that the government has a civil service behind it, so a minister, when making a point or making a case, can get a, has got a whole army of civil servants who can. Uh, do the research and draft the policy and all the rest of it. And so, if the opposition is trying, is, is, is going to have any chance of competing in anything like a, a, um, a, a an even playing field, then they need they need their own people who can it can be doing the same thing in, in supporting the shadow ministers. And, and often, this is one of the ways when, the, when you get a new government, when you got all these advisors and stuff coming in, because they were often the people who were working with the party uh, when they were in opposition. Right, probably the biggest spectacle in Parliament is uh, Prime Minister's question time, uh, and and this is uh, has been 
sadly hit by what's been going on uh, with all the COVID stuff. So PMQs, they're, they're every Wednesday that Parliament is in session. They're at midday. They only last for 30 minutes. So in theory, this is a great weekly opportunity for the opposition to hold the Prime Minister to account uh, over events of the day or backbenchers to hold the government to account o over events of the day uh, and policies that are ongoing and and to make sure that the government's on top of whatever major thing is that is, is happening at the time. However, it is normally just descends into kind of political theatre. Every turns up and they wave their ballot, they wave bits of paper and go at each other, uh, and they heckle and they just generally act like um, school children. Um, it has looked very different in 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 recent uh, recent times with people on video coming in and 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 the house being far less empty. Far, far more empty than it normally is, far less, far less MPs in it, and you can see a bit above me where you've got a, a, a normal PMQs uh, with uh, Johnson at the centre of the theatre and all the benches absolutely round and people standing, and then you, you've got a more recent image with um, some people on screen and socially distanced MPs. Now, if we go back through things, now, Corbyn and May were both considered to be particularly poor performers uh, at Prime Minister's Question Time. The Labour Party had great hope uh, with Starmer coming uh, 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 as as leader. He, he bringing the, the the all the skills that he's developed through his, his earlier career as a prosecutor. But it is worth noting that that Parliament is not a law court, uh, and so he, he it, even if he you you might from a technical point of view look at it and go well he he's completely outdone Johnson in that argument or that argument. Um, that, that you can't land it's very difficult to land a knockout blow as a leader of the opposition in PMQs and one thing Johnson is particularly adept at he, he, he's wheeling out um, sound bites which I know are rather than answers to the question but a nice sound bite and a retort which will be played in short clips on, on the news on TV news on radio news and things like that um, so it can mean that in terms of the again in, in the audience of public uh, public opinion that that, that that what Starmer does at question time doesn't necessarily change hearts and minds in the country and, and what people will see will be a, a short bit of, of Starmer's questioning and then a, the, the nice little kind of soundbite of, of Johnson's retort. Um, the, we've had all the stuff with the video links and the empty chamber. Uh, one of the things that's been really old about watching Prime Minister's Question Time during COVID is, is Johnson seems kind of surprised and offended when, when the opposition particularly Starmer, uh, criticised the government and what it's doing and starts calling for national unity and things like that and kind of almost missing the point of the whole thing, that it, it's the it's the opposition's job to to, to scrutinise what he's doing, criticise bits that they think could be done better. Um, Johnson seems to, 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 to want them to be providing a, a detailed alternative um, plan all the time. But again, that's not actually the point of what what is going on. What is supposed to be going on is the government does something and the opposition points out the flaws in it. Um, some of the, the theatre in Prime Minister's Question Time is particularly cringy. You get the planted questions from members of the Prime Minister's own party, and this has happened with, with both parties throughout all the time I can ever remember on this, which is quite a while. Um, and it goes along the lines of something um, uh, like, will the Prime Minister agree that they are brilliant, the government is doing a brilliant job, the people love you, uh, and the leader of the opposition smells? It, it not quite those words, but essentially that's that's what it is. So it'll be maybe something to do with seeing time in their constituency. And when <clears throat> will, will the prime minister agree with me that the X that we've done has just been absolutely amazing? It's a wonderful thing for my members, the members of my constituency. Um, yeah, it, and, and 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 so it's it, it, a lot of it is just political point scoring, and there's a bit of backslapping to kind of counter the stuff where they they're getting attacked. Um, the backbench is often acting like some kind of football crowd when they're all allowed in, uh, kind of cheering their own side, heckling the opposition, particularly the noise tends to intensify when it's the opposition leader. Actually, we found out quite a lot of this stuff is completely orchestrated, that, that, that actually the Prime Minister's office has been around saying to everybody, right, we want you to heckle um, Corbyn or Starmer with this, and, and can you all make lots of noise at this point um, so uh, to, to kind of drown out uh, the questions or to to make lots of noise to show support for the prime minister as they gonna as they respond to questions on this to show to show that we're united and we'll be we'll behind them now 
Prime Ministers have said, even some of the are very proficient, very good public speakers like Blair, have said that they found that the, the event a kind of terror-inspiring, courage-draining experience. Uh, and it is only 30 minutes. But again, if, if people who are good public speakers like Blair was, who find this quite difficult, then you can imagine. For those who aren't maybe not <coughs> quite as natural at it, uh, that that this is, is, is a, can be an absolutely horrendous experience. Whether it actually changes much in politics, is, however, is debatable. Though it's one of these areas where, again, if we look at prime ministers and leaders of the opposition who haven't performed very well in it, and then we've looked at their, 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 if you then look at their approval ratings, they tend to they tend to be quite low. So May and, and Corbyn, again, who, neither of whom were wildly popular, both both again struggled at PMQs. Um, Again, as an opinion, you, you, you may well you, you you may well disagree with that and think that they they, they did a wonderful job. Um, during uh, PMQs, the um, the leader of the opposition gets six questions that they ask in two blocks of three. The leader of the third biggest party gets two questions. All all of this there's in, in all of this there seems to be very little scrutiny and lots of political point scoring, as I've said. So it, again, uh, PMQs, it's fun to watch. Um, it is it, a good way of staying on on top of what's going on in politics. Uh, it's only 30 minutes, uh, whether, whether the government is genuinely kind of pulled over the coals on it, uh, I, I would say it's very debatable. So the, the purpose then of all uh, of ministerial question time, so we've looked at PMQ, so this is kind of more more um, more broad uh, ministerial questioning. So there's a rotation where the different ministers um, are stand in front of parliament and are questioned about their department and its policies and how well it's been implemented. This tends to be more effective than scrutiny than what's going on in the PMQs. Um, it tends to be slightly less crowded uh, chamber. There's pe more pe people who are, are more particular have particular interest in what's going on with that that uh, with that uh, department at that time. Um, the, the questions tend to be a bit more detailed, a bit more probing. The answers tend to be a bit fuller and a bit and, and a bit better backed up. Um, ministers get notification of the oral questions that are coming, which means that they that, that they can prepare detailed answers on those with the support from the civil service. So again, it, you you get maybe a high, slightly higher quality of answer um, than than you get at PMQs. We, so the, what we tend to focus on as people watching politics and st is we tend to focus on the oral questions, but actually the vast majority of what happens, it, about 10 times more of them, are written questions which are written um, to, to, to ministers asking um, questions about um, seeking information, asking about particular policies, how things are going, um, what the rationale is behind a certain proposal or a certain piece of secondary legislation or all those different bits or the response to a particular crisis or problem at the time. So 2015-16 we got 35,000 written questions compared to the 3,600 oral questions that were asked. So the, the written bit is, is again a bit more unseen but tends to play a bigger role. I hope all that has been um, has been helpful for you in terms of looking at this idea of um, the interaction between Parliament and, and the executive. So this is part of my playlist looking at A-level politics. I'm sorry, as I go through and teach it, I'm trying to cover uh, the whole of the specification as we teach it at my college. So I've done the whole of component uh, one. This is part of um, component two. In, in component three, we do um, the US, uh, and again, the, you'll, you'll find a whole series of videos uh, on that. There's also a, 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 a playlist. It, it, they're all in the main A-level uh, politics playlist, but there's a place on, on political ideologies and in that look at liberalism, uh, socialism, conservatism, and nationalism. So there's lots out there. There's also videos in the playlist on how to do all the different question types, how to hit the different uh, assessment objectives, uh, how to achieve top grades. There's a whole range of stuff on politics in there. There's also a lot of separate uh, playlists on different bits of, uh, of history, again, particularly uh, aiming at A-level. So hopefully lots of stuff in here to help you with your studies. Uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. If you've got any questions or, or queries or comments, and, and please leave them behind. If you're interested in what I'm doing just because you're interested in politics or because you're studying A-level politics, uh, then please subscribe, turn on notifications and find out as I add more and more videos. Thank you very much for watching.